When Paul Goodman wrote Growing Up Absurd in 1959, he electrified the public with his description of the shattering impact on the young generation of the spiritual emptiness of contemporary society. Now, eight years later, it is not spiritual emptiness that is terrifying, but spiritual evil. In 1967, young men of America are fighting, dying, and killing in Asian jungles in a war whose purposes are so ambiguous the whole nation sees with dissent. They are told they are sacrificing for democracy, but the Saigon regime, their ally, is a mockery of democracy, and the black American soldier has himself never experienced democracy. While the war devours the young abroad, at home urban outbreaks pit black youth against young soldiers and guardsmen as racial and economic injustice exhaust human endurance. Prosperity gluts the middle and upper class while poverty imprisons more than 30 million Americans and literally starvation stalks rural areas of the South. Crime rises in every segment of society. As diseases are conquered and health improved, mass drug consumption and alcoholism assume epidemic proportions. The alienation of young people from society rises to unprecedented levels and masses of voluntary exiles emerge as modern gypsies, aimless and empty. This generation is engaged in a cold war, not only with the earlier generation, but with the values of its society. It is not the familiar and normal hostility of the young groping for independence, it has a new quality of bitter antagonism and confused anger, which suggests basic issues are being contested. These are unprecedented attitudes because this generation was born and matured in unprecedented conditions. The generation of the past 25 years cannot be understood without remembering that it has lived during that period through the effects of four wars, World War II, the Cold War, the Korean War, and Vietnam. No other generation of young Americans was ever exposed to a remotely similar traumatic experience. Yet, as spiritually and physically abrasive as this may be, it is not the worst aspect of contemporary experience. This is the first generation to grow up in the era of the nuclear bomb, knowing that it may be the last generation of mankind. This is a generation not only of war, but of war in its ultimate revelation. This is a generation that truly has no place to hide and no place to find security. These are evils enough to send a reason reeling. And of course, they are not the only ones. All of them form part of the matrix in which this generation's character and experience were formed. The tempest of evils provides the answer for those adults who ask why this young generation is so unfathomable, so alienated, and frequently so freakish. For the young people of today, peace and social tranquility are as unreal and remote as night errantry. Under the impact of social forces unique to their times, young people have splintered into three principal groups, though of course there is some overlap among the three. The largest group of young people is struggling to adopt itself to the prevailing values of our society. Without much enthusiasm, they'd accept the system of government, the economic relationships of the property system, 
and the social stratifications both engender. But even so, they are a profoundly troubled group and are harsh critics of the status quo. In this largest group, social attitudes are not congealed or determined. They are fluid and suching. Though all recent studies point to the fact that the war in Vietnam is our focus of concern, most of them are not ready to resist the draft or to take clear-cut stands on issues of violence and nonviolence. But their consciences have been touched by the feeling that is growing all over the world of the horror and insanity of war, of the imperative need to respect life, of the urgency of moving past war as a way to solve international problems. So while they will not glorify war, and while they feel ambiguous about America's military posture, this majority group reflects the confusion of the larger society, which is itself caught up in a kind of transitional state of conscience as it moves slowly toward the realization that war cannot be justified in the human future. That is the second group of young people. They are the radicals. They range from moderate to extreme in the degree to which they want to alter the social system. All of them agree that only by structural change can current evils be eliminated because the roots are in the system rather than in men are in faulty operation. These are a new breed of radicals. Very few adhere to established ideology. Some borrow from old doctrines of revolution, but practically all of them suspend judgment on what the form of a new society must be. They are in serious revolt against old values and have not yet concretely formulated the new ones. They are not repeating previous revolutionary doctrines. Most of them have not even read the revolutionary classics. Ironically, their rebelliousness comes from having been frustrated in seeking change within the framework of the existing society. They tried to build racial equality and met tenacious and vicious opposition. They worked to end the Vietnam War and experienced futility. So they seek a fresh start with new rules and a new order. It is fair to say, though, that at present, they know what they don't want rather than what they do want. Their radicalism is growing because the power structure of today is unrelenting in defending not only its social system, but the evils it contains. So naturally, it is intensifying the opposition. What is the attitude of this second radical group to the problem of violence? In a word, mixed. There are young radicals today who are pacifists, and there are many who are armchair revolutionaries who insist on the political and psychological need for violence. These young theorists of violence elaborately scorn the process of dialogue in favor of the tactics of confrontation. They glorify the guerrilla movement, and especially its new motto, Che Guevara, and they equate revolutionary consciousness with the readiness to shed blood. But across the spectrum of attitudes towards violence that can be found among the radicals, is that a unifying thread? I think that is. Whether they read Gandhi or Franz Fanon, all the radicals understand the need for action, direct, self-transforming and structure-transforming action. This may be their most creative collective insight. The young people in the third group I mentioned earlier are currently called hippies. They may be traced in a fairly direct line from yesterday's beatniks. The hippies are not only colorful but complex, and in many respects they had extreme conduct 
illuminates the negative effect of society's evils on sensitive young people. While there are variations, those who identify with this group have a common philosophy. They are struggling to disengage from society as that expression of their rejection of it. They disavow responsibility to organize society. Unlike the radicals, they are not seeking change but flight. When occasionally they merge with a peace demonstration, it is not to better the political world but to give expression to their own world. The hardcore hippie is a remarkable contradiction. He uses drugs to turn inward, away from reality, to find peace and security. Yet he advocates love as the highest human value, love which can exist only in communication between people and not in the total isolation of the individual. The importance of the hippies is not in their unconventional behavior, but in the fact that some hundreds of thousands of young people, in turning to a flight from reality, are expressing a profoundly discrediting judgment on the society they emerge from. It seems to me that the hippies will not last long as a mass group. They cannot survive because there is no solution in escape. Some of them may persist by solidifying into a secular religious sect. Their movement already has many such characteristics. We might see some of them establish utopian colonies, like the 17th and 18th century communities established by sects that profoundly opposed the existing order and its values. Those communities did not survive, but they were important to their contemporaries because their dream of social justice and human value continues as a dream of mankind. In this context, one dream of the hippie group is very significant. And that is its dream of peace. Most of the hippies are pacifists, and a few have thought their way through to a persuasive and psychologically sophisticated peace strategy. And society at large may be more ready now to learn from that dream than it was a century or two ago, to listen to the argument for peace, not as a dream, but as a practical possibility, something to choose and use. From this quick tour of the three main groupings of our young people, it should be evident that this generation is in substantial ferment. Even the large group that is not disaffected from society is putting forward basic questions. And its restlessness helps to account for the radicals with their angry protest and the hippies with their systematic withdrawal. When the less sensitive supporters of the status quo try to argue against some of these condemnations and challenges, they usually cite the technological marvels our society has achieved. However, that only reveals their poverty of spirit. Mammoth productive facilities with computer minds, cities that engulf the landscape and pierce the clouds, planes that almost outrace time, these are awesome, but they cannot be spiritually inspiring. Nothing in our glittering technology can raise man to new heights because material growth has been made an end in itself. In the absence of moral purpose, man himself becomes smaller as the works of man become bigger. Another distortion in the technological revolution is that instead of strengthening democracy at home, it has helped to eviscerate it. Gargantuan industry and government woven into an intricate computerized mechanism leaves a person outside. 
The sense of participation is lost. The feeling that ordinary individuals influence important decisions vanishes, and man becomes separated and diminished. When an individual is no longer a true participant, when he no longer feels a sense of responsibility to his society, the content of democracy is emptied. When culture is degraded and vulgarity enthroned, when the social system does not build security but induces peril, inexorably the individual is impelled to pull away from a soulless society. This process produces alienation, perhaps the most pervasive and insidious development in contemporary society. Alienation is not confined to our young people, but it is rampant among them. Yet alienation should be foreign to the young. Growth requires connection and trust. Alienation is a form of living death. It is the acid of despair that dissolves society. Up to now, I have been looking at the tragic factors in the quarter century of history that today's youth has lived through. But is that another side? Are there forces in that quarter century that could reverse the process of alienation? We now must go back over those 25 years to search for positive ingredients which have been there, but in relative obscurity. Against the exaltation of technology, there has always been a force struggling to respect higher values. None of the current evils rose without resistance, nor have they persisted without opposition. During the early 1950s, the hangman operating within the Cold War troops was McCarthyism. For years, it decimated social organizations, throttled free expression, and intimidated into bleak silence not only liberals and radicals, but men in hide and protected places. A very small band of courageous people fought back, braving ostracism, slander, and loss of livelihood. Gradually and painfully, however, the democratic instinct of Americans was awakened, and the ideological brute force was rooted. By the way, Canada played a valuable role. CBC Radio produced a satire of extraordinary brilliance on McCarthyism entitled The Investigator, which was recorded and widely circulated in the United States with devastating effect. However, McCarthyism left a legacy of social paralysis. Fear persisted through succeeding years, and social reform remained inhibited and defensive. A blanket of conformity and intimidation conditioned young and old to exalt mediocrity and convention. Criticism of the social order was still imbued with implications of treason. The war in Korea was unpopular, but it was never subject to the such in criticism and mass demonstrations that currently characterize the opposition to the war in Vietnam. The blanket of fear was lifted by Negro youth. When they took their struggle to the streets, a new spirit of resistance was born. Inspired by the boldness and ingenuity of Negroes, white youth stirred into action and formed an alliance that aroused the conscience of the nation. It is difficult to exaggerate the creative contribution of young Negroes. They took nonviolent resistance, first employed in Montgomery, Alabama, in mass dimensions, and developed original forms of application, sit-ins, freedom rides, and wait-ins. To accomplish these, they first transformed themselves. Young Negroes had traditionally imitated whites in dress, conduct, and thought in a rigid middle-class pattern. 
Gunnar Myrdal described them as exaggerated Americans. Now they ceased imitating and began initiating. Leadership passed into the hands of Negroes, and their white allies began learning from them. This was a revolutionary and wholesome development for both. It is ironic that today so many educators and sociologists are seeking methods to instill middle-class values in Negro youth as an ideal in social development. It was precisely when young Negroes threw off their middle-class values that they made an historic social contribution. They abandoned those values when they put careers and wealth in a secondary role, when they cheerfully became jailbirds and troublemakers, when they took off their Brooks Brothers attire and put on overalls to work in the isolated rural South they challenged and inspired white youth to emulate them. Many left school not to abandon learning, but to seek it in more direct ways. They were constructive school dropouts, a variety that strengthened society and themselves. These Negro and white youth preceded the conception of the Peace Corps. And it is safe to say that their work was the inspiration for its organization on an international scale. The collective effort that was born out of the Civil Rights Alliance was awesomely fruitful for this century in the first years of the 1960s. The repressive forces that had not been seriously challenged for almost a decade now faced an aroused adversary. A torrent of humanist thought and action swept across the land, scoring first small and then larger victories. The awakening grew in breath, and the contested issues encompassed other social questions. A phalanx of reliable young activists took protests from hiding and revived a sense of responsible rebellion. A peace movement was born. The Negro Freedom Movement would have been historic and worthy even if it had only served the cause of civil rights. But its laurels are greater because it stimulated a broader social movement that elevated the moral level of the nation. In the struggle against the preponderant evils of the society, decent values were preserved. Moreover, a significant body of young people learned that in opposing the tyrannical forces that were crushing them, they added stature and meaning to their lives. The alliance of Negro and white youth that fought bruising engagements with the status quo inspired each other with a sense of moral mission, and both gave the nation an example of self-sacrifice and dedication these years, the late 60s, are the most crucial time for the movement I have been describing. That is a sense in which it can be said that the civil rights and peace movements are over, at least in their first form, the protest form, which gave them their first victories. That is a sense in which the alliance of responsible young people, which the movement represented, has fallen apart under the impact of failures, discouragement, and consequent extremism and polarization. The movement for social change has entered a time of temptation to despair, because it is clear now how deep and systematic are the evils it confronts. That is a strong temptation to despair of programs and actions, and to dissipate energy in hysterical talk, that is a temptation to break up into mutually suspicious extremist groups in which blacks reject the participation of whites and whites reject the realities of their own history. But meanwhile, as the young people face this crisis, leaders in the movement are working out programs to bring the social movements through from their early and now inadequate protest phase to a new 
stage of massive, active, nonviolent resistance to the evils of the modern system. As this work and this planning proceed, we begin to glimpse tremendous vistas of what it might mean for the world if the new programs of resistance succeed in forging an even wider alliance of today's awakened youth. Nonviolent, active resistance to social evils including massive civil disobedience when that is need for it, can unite in a new action synthesis the best insights of all three groups I have pointed out among our young people. From the hippies, it can accept the vision of peaceful means to a goal of peace, and also their sense of beauty, gentleness, and of the unique gifts of each man's spirit. From the radicals, it can adopt the burning sense of urgency, the recognition of the need for direct and collective action, and the need for strategy and organization. And because the emerging program is neither one of anarchy nor of despair, it can welcome the work and insights of those young people who have not rejected our present society in its totality. They can challenge the more extreme groups to integrate the new vision into history as it actually is, into society as it actually works. They can help the movement not to break the bruised reed or quench the smoking wick of values that are already recognized in the society we want to change. And they can help open the possibility of honorable compromise. If the early civil rights movement bore some international fruit in the formation of a Peace Corps, this new alliance could do far more. Already our best young workers in the United States are talking about the need to organize in international dimensions. They are beginning to form conscious connections with their opposite numbers in other countries. The conscience of an awakened activist cannot be satisfied with a focus on local problems, if only because he sees that local problems are all interconnected with world problems. The young men who are beginning to see that they must refuse to leave their country in order to fight and kill others might decide to leave their country at least for a while in order to share their life with others. There is as yet not even an outline in existence of what structure this growing world consciousness might find for itself. But a dozen years ago, there was not even an outline for the Negro Civil Rights Movement in its first phase. The spirit is awake now, structures will follow if we keep our ears open to the spirit. Perhaps the structural forms will emerge from other countries, propelled by another experience of the shaping of history. But we do not have much time. The revolutionary spirit is already worldwide. If the anger of the peoples of the world at the injustice of things is to be channeled into a revolution of love and creativity, we must begin now to work urgently with all the peoples to shape a new world. Dr. Martin Luther King.